Welcome back, folks. We have received a letter from the researcher Ashton Forbes, who was the intended recipient in the earlier publication of the Diego Garcia story. We are happy that we could facilitate the communication, and we now need to do some clarifications in the name of journalism. Important to know, when you send us a story, you are guaranteed that we won't share it in any other way than the intended format. What we offer is for anyone to be able to share their story as a fictional radio theatrical production. As always, when you submit your story, you should use a good VPN and a throwaway email account. And we will publish your story in the confusing format of real made up stories. Next, we want to clarify what elements of the Diego Garcia story that is creative freedom on our part. First, the original letter we received does not mention Diego Garcia by name. We found the name by Googling military bases in the Maldives. So let us be clear about this. In all publications on this channel, the script is everything and all that is original. The naming of an episode, the thumbnail and hashtags are all clickbait. They are never a part of the letter. Second, the original letter was not fully in English. We used Google Translate and the writing software Grammarly to make the English version. This is not perfect, but it gets the message through and that's what we care about. Third, all pictures and voices are AI, including me. This is to make sure that all publications clearly are fictional. No real people, no real voices or pictures. We are the perfect publication service for you who have great stories to tell, but can't because it would get you killed. And if anyone would ask us, we make up all stories on our own. So if you want the latest real world stories and insider information, press the subscribe button. Now on to tonight's programming. A lady in Jersey has a story about glitter. Yes, the shiny plastic. And this story might shock you. It's a two parter, a lot scarier and more interesting than it sounds. We just don't know how to package it. It's a great story. Let's go. I'm almost 60 now, and I have been working in logistics since I was in my 20s. And my last job before I moved to where I live now was a glitter factory. Yes, the shiny and sparkly things you have used in arts and crafts when you were a kid. And I want to share one of the weirdest things I ever experienced, and possibly the most important piece of information I ever had. Some backstory. I met my husband at university, we got jobs, got pregnant, and moved back to my hometown outside New York. I started my career in 1991 at Hess, a failing store chain, and just a few years later I left my job as a logistics assistant to become a logistics manager at a mail order company. And a few years after that, I started working for one of the bigger well-known brands in the business. In the crash of 2008, logistics took a hard fall and we got laid off. And after a few months, I got a job at a glitter factory. They did not seem bothered with the economic situation at all and with time I managed both customer relations and the logistics for their orders. It's an uncommon role, but the customer relations part of my job made it the best work experience I ever had. In 2018, me and my husband got divorced, and in 2019, I left the glitter company and moved out of state, a new beginning after the divorce, and to be close to my daughter who went off to college. And last week, I got a letter Five years after I left the company, I got a handwritten letter from a former colleague I barely remembered. We weren't close, but maybe he had somewhat of a crush on me, I think. He was a very nice man, working in production. We did not meet often, but when we did, we always had a good eye for each other. He must be in his late 60s now, and from what I understand from the letter, he is probably not with us anymore. Something is very wrong, and I will share his letter to me as it is. For you to understand the letter he sent me, there are a few things to know about glitter. First, all glitter in the world is made in one place, a small grouping on the east coast of the U.S., not China or India, all in the same area on U.S. soil. I think that might be important. Second, the security around everything relating to the production of glitter is crazy. I didn't really reflect on it at first. Everyone in manufacturing wants to protect their methods. But it was over the top, to say the least. In our case, the production line is in its own locked-off part of the building, and the people who work there have their own entrance and lunchroom. Lastly, the customers. Glitter is used in so many things. We have customers in the obvious industries like paints, arts, and crafts, and cosmetics, and lesser-known things like rubber factories in Asia, glass factories, and American building companies. Around 2010, maybe 2011, we started to get a bit stranger customers big accounts, in medicine and technology that get special glitters that are packaged on their own separate lines. 
the Packers need to wear protective gear, and you need to complete a course about how to work safely and how to put on and remove protective gear. This was something unexpected for us, and the volumes quickly became about the same as all of the more common customer types combined. From the outside, I think that medicine and technology are unexpected customers for a glitter factory. Well, it is. But then and there, it was good news, and the company could grow. And then there is that last customer. It started at the same time, I think. In the beginning of 2012, we built a whole new wing on the building for this customer, and the packaging was fully automated, something fairly new and very expensive back then. They quickly became our biggest client that more than doubled our revenue and bought more glitter than all other accounts combined. There was trouble in that wing. The staff turnover was exceptionally high, and the people that was hired was poorly qualified. Not at all like the rest of the company. Most of my colleagues back then have been working there their whole life. The pay was great, good benefits, and a really good caring company culture overall. The thing is, since the packaging was automated in the new wing, the number of employees was low, three shifts with three or four people at most. The staff count in our part of the building was high. We could easily have sent a few of our guys and girls to help with the packing when they were low on staff. We offered multiple times but got nothing more than friendly replies that it was not needed. And one day, a rumor started. One of the younger girls working the non-protective packing lines had a story about her older brother's friend, who got hooked on some drug that he claimed we were manufacturing, and he had gotten arrested by the police trying to break into the house of one of his former colleagues. If the story was true, he did work in the wing, got fired, and then tried to break into the house of one of his former colleagues to steal more of the drug they were all smuggling out from the building. Complete nonsense. But, in a few days, the girl who told the story was gone. No replacement came, and when asked, we got the answer that she chose to quit. And this was a great girl who did nothing wrong, was always on time, and was a good worker. I don't know if anyone contacted her outside of work, but it was a strange event. One morning in, I think it was 2015, I was called to a meeting with my manager who wanted to talk about me managing the wing as an interim for a few months. I have no recruitment experience, and the little managing I did at the packaging lines in our part of the building was limited. He calmly explained that the board trusts me and that I should see it as an opportunity to grow as a person, and maybe, if I enjoy it, consider it to be a path in my future career. Not something you say no to. So I said yes, and informed all my accounts that my colleague will be their go-to for the next few months, and the next week I got new passes and a short introduction by my manager. It was weird. A very small room. The building is massive. It was two small rooms built inside the loading area. No windows, low ceiling, and not much room to move. My first thought was that this is the problem. No one wants to work like this. White walls, white floor, white ceiling with big rectangular recessed lights. In the middle of the room was a stainless packing machine, the size of a minivan. No tables, no chairs, no screens, no light switch and the only things that could be operated was emergency stop buttons, a lever to fasten the bulk containers that was filled up by the machine, a door sensor to the next room, and a ceiling-mounted vacuum. At the end of the east wall, there was a roll-up door, also white, into another same-sized room, also all white, that had another roll-up door out to the loading area and the loading docks. I asked about the small space, and he answered that it was according to the customer's specifications. The first shift was the night shift that day, and it went smooth, and I could not see anything that would be grounds for a troubled work environment. Three young men, all in white protective gear, friendly, funny, and efficient. We did almost 100 IBC tanks, that's close to 100,000 liters of product in eight hours, and, yeah, everything went smooth. The machine dispenses product in IBC tanks, and the personnel rolls it out in the other room comes back with an empty tank and parks it in place, closes the lever, and the filling process continues. This back and forth must be done since the packing room is so small. A strange and ineffective setup. Another thing was the cleaning. Each group cleans the rooms thoroughly after every shift, vacuuming the floors, mopping all floors and walls with dispensable pads, emptying the vacuum filter to the special thick yellow plastic bags we use for all disposables, and throwing them in a separate container standing inside the building. 
We don't keep any other containers inside. It's a strange thing to do. I am not a night shift worker, so I got back the next day to greet the afternoon team, and it was all the same, two young men and a woman. Same bit. More than 90 tanks and no issues. On Wednesday, I met the morning crew, older group, in their late 30s, but same feeling and same result. No problems. I could not have expected what was coming. The product was strange. Normal glitter, all glitter, looks pretty much the same. Different colors and sizes, but they all glitter. That's the whole point. This glitter did the complete opposite. It was as if it was eating up the light. It was weird to look at. I have seen pictures of the world's blackest paint on Instagram. It was like that, but it wasn't black. I would like to say it was dim white or semi-transparent, but it was hard to tell. Hard to focus on an unreal material. It got even stranger when I was talking about the product with the morning team a few days in. They showed me that the product, when wet, becomes completely invisible. You know those clear glass balls on YouTube that just disappears when they fill up the jug with water? Exactly like that. Okay, so glitter that eats light and becomes invisible when wet. That's 70% of our total product output every year. Then it happened. Okay, folks, that was part one. We cut it short since you have short attention spans according to the statistics on YouTube. In part two, we will get the full story. So make sure to click that subscribe button not to miss out on more real world strangeness and the final, and I must say, very scary part of the glitter story. Stay safe out there and have a good night. <laughs>